Romans chapter 16, verse 3, when you say, when you got to say, I got it. I want to talk to you on the subject of having a missional marriage. Paul's writing the church in Rome and he's sending greetings and he writes this. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all of the churches, someone say all of the churches, all the churches of the Gentiles, thank them too. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. I want to talk to you about the power and the importance of a missional marriage. Now, if you're single, don't tune me out now. Lean in here. Come on, somebody. Singles, I think, ought to lean into this message. The reason I think this is such an important message is because the church needs marriages. The world needs marriages. The world needs to see healthy marriages. Um, you know, for the first time in the church, 60% of marriages end in divorce. That, that's happening in the house of God. 60% of marriages end in divorce. They go on to say that 75% of second marriages end in divorce. And 90% of third marriages end in divorce. And if you're married a fourth time, it's pretty much not going to work. <laughs> See, marriages matter. Marriage matters to God. Marriage matters to the church. We need to see healthy marriages. We need young people that will live lives of purity. We need young people that will determine now, even at a young age, that they're going to save themselves for the right person. I was reading a statistic that said 40% of people married before 25 years old ends in divorce. 40%. I, I got married when I was 22. And Georgina was 23. And we had some tough times early on. I think maybe when I think about some of those tough times that we had early on in our marriages, because we were, we were not whole yet. We were not at that place where we were able to come into a marriage not as two half people, but two whole people. So if you're single and you're young and you see all these people get married and you're always a bridesmaid or a groom in the wedding, be patient. Let God build you up. Let God make you strong. Let God make you whole. Come on, how many can say amen? Let, let God do a work in your life. Another statistic says 41% of people who are sexually active before the age of 20, their marriage ends in divorce. And I thank God for a church that will preach about sexual purity. I thank God for a ministry that won't compromise. I thank God for young women that have that purity ring on the finger. Come on, ladies. Some gang girls that will have that purity ring on their finger. I think we should make some rings for the guys. Because you got some scoundrels in the house of God. See, the guys are like, oh, no, here he goes. Yeah. How many think we ought to talk about it? We need some young men that will keep their way pure. We need some young men that will stop living like the world. We need some young men that will stop lusting over everything that moves. You'd, you'd fall in love with a tree if it moved. Come on, ladies, help me. Come on, help me. How many think it's time that we raise up some godly marriages, some missional marriages, some young men and women that are pure before the Lord that do things right in the house of God? See, missional marriages provide stability for missional movements. God has called us as a movement. He's chosen us to be a movement in the earth, a movement in his kingdom, to advance his kingdom for his glory. And we are missional as a movement, but we need some missional marriages because missional marriages bring stability to missional movements. I want to talk to you about three keys to having a missional marriage. The first thing is that missional marriages possess vision. Somebody say vision. Do you got a vision? Does your marriage have a vision? When we look at Priscilla and Aquila, 
we find that if it had not been for their marriage, the church might not have turned out the way it did. Think about how powerful a marriage is. That this couple, they were so dynamic. In fact, they were one of the first dynamic duos of the church. One of the first dynamic duos of the New Testament. Their marriage was such a blessing to Paul and to the early church. Paul actually thanks them, not only on behalf of himself, but he says all the Gentile churches thank God for this marriage. Thank God for this dynamic duo that served the Lord and were a powerful team. Priscilla and Aquila were mentioned seven times in the New Testament. And whenever they're mentioned, they're always mentioned together. Come on, somebody. That's powerful. Priscilla and Aquila mentioned together. See, when marriages are built around a mission and a vision, they're likely to do two things. Write this down. Number one, they're likely to make an impact in this world. They're they're likely to make an impact. When, When two marriages have a vision and a mission, impact must follow. We know that one can have authority, but two can have dominion. And I believe that God raises up Holy Ghost filled missional marriages so that they can take dominion over their family. They can take dominion over their legacy. They can take dominion over their business. They can take dominion in the ministry. Come on, shout to the Lord. I believe God gives these types of marriages dominion wherever they go. Somebody say dominion. See, another thing that happens in a marriage with a vision is that they're much more likely to succeed and thrive as a marriage. That's what we need. We need marriages that aren't just making it through. We don't need marriages that are surviving. We need marriages that are thriving for God. And and these marriages will succeed and thrive. Priscilla and Aquila knew of God. Hear this. They knew of God. But they didn't have a Christ-centered vision, mission, until they met Paul. It, It wasn't until they met the Apostle Paul that their vision came alive. That their purpose came alive because when Paul came into their life, he began to talk to them about the preaching of the gospel. He began to talk to them about the taking the message to the Gentiles. He began to talk to them about the things that God desired to do. The revival that God wanted to pour out with the religious leaders. And it's when Priscilla and Aquila, who knew God, came into contact with Paul that their whole vision came alive, that their literal marriage and their world was turned upside down. See, vision is so important. And I want to tell you there are three benefits of a mission-driven marriage. Who's ready for this? The first thing is that when a marriage has a vision, the vision will take your marriage deeper. (laughs) It'll take your marriage deeper. When, when you have a vision in your marriage, or and, and this, goes, this is singles, don't get tired on me. Don't, don't you dare fall asleep on this message now. Because you'll never have a vision in your marriage until you have a vision in your life. Vision makes us deep. Vision gives our life meaning. And vision gives our marriage meaning. When, when God's given a, a vision to a marriage, there's a deeper desire for exampleship. To live lives as an example, to understand that with that vision, people are watching us. People are inspired by us. Come on now. People are inspired by how we live. They're inspired about how we lead our lives, and they're inspired by how we lead our families. The second great benefit of a mission-driven marriage is that it solidifies our friendship in a marriage. Our friendship. You know, what is friendship? Friendship is the result of two people who have a common interest and common goals. That's what friends are. You know, when you have friends, you have something to relate about. You have something to talk about. You have something to commune about. When when one wins, you both win. You celebrate one another. Can I hear an amen? There's no team like a team victory. There's no greater victory than a team victory. And when two people come together around a vision and come together around a a, a mission, they've got that common interest. They've got that common goals. And and I think it's important that as married couples, we're friends. Come on now. That that spouse of yours is not an old ball and chain. Come on now. 
If you're walking around and that spouse feels like a ball and chain, it's probably because you lost your friendship. You got to come back into a place of friendship. Come on now. I thank God that when I think about my wife, Georgina, and with all the gifts and all the talents that she has, really, she is my best friend. She's been my best friend before anything. I tell my kids all the time. I thank God for you, but before you guys came, me and mom had a whole life. (laughs) We existed in a whole life. We had a whole world before y'all came along and tried to mess everything up. I thank God for a wife that's a friend. I thank God for somebody that's, come on, enjoyed the victories and we've suffered the defeats together, but we're in this together. Come on, who can thank God for their spouse? Come on, who could thank God for somebody that's a friend? And the, and the third benefit of a mission-driven marriage is that, and, and this is a big one, when you have a vision and a mission, it makes your marriage more exciting. Good Lord, there are some boring marriages. I didn't preach this yesterday. I felt like it. Some of y'all got some boring marriages. You know, boring. What are we going to do today? Same thing you did yesterday. Nothing. You know, mission and vision makes marriage exciting. You know what's amazing about a mission and a vision is that when you have a mission and a vision, there's many twists and turns. There's many twists and turns to that vision, twists and turns to that mission. There's your ups and there's your downs. Sometimes when you have a vision, it's like riding a roller coaster. Come on, you're up one day, you're down the next, you're on the mountaintop one day, you're in the valley the next. Life brings pain. Remember that. Life brings pain. Life brings opposition. There are some things in life that are hard to deal with. But you know what makes a a, a marriage exciting is that when you have a mission and a vision, you discover that with that vision and that mission, there's purpose in the pain. (laughs) Without a vision and and, and without a mission... Pain is just pain. Life is just hard. Situations are just insurmountable. But when you have a vision and a mission together, you say, hey, God must be doing something. God must be getting us ready. God must be preparing. Can somebody say amen? You're going to have ups and you're going to have downs, but it's exciting when you have a vision. And it's exciting when you have a mission. Come on, clap in this place. Come on, married couples, clap in this place. Your pain starts to make some sense. See, even your decisions as a married couple are made with a mission in mind. You start to make decisions in your life with the mission in mind. You start to think about what is God desiring to do through this decision? What is God desiring to do through this business? What is God desiring to do through these kids going to college? What is God desiring to do through even buying this home? My wife and I, we've owned multiple homes throughout our marriage. And every time we've bought a home, we've always picked a home, not just so that we can kick back, not just so that I could have a man cave and a a barca lounger or a lazy boy chair. Yes, our home is a place of safety. Yes, our home is a place to take your armor off. Yes, our home is a place to pray and to refuel and to enjoy your family and make memories, but understand a home is a place where the ministry of the Holy Spirit should be flowing, where your mission should flow out of your home. I thank God for people that have turned their homes into ministry houses, ministry hubs. They say, you can have a house fire here. You can have a life group here. The gospel can be preached. Come on, church. That's the type of marriages that we need. Come on. See, missional marriages not only possess vision, and and let me give you one last note. You notice that whenever Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned, they're mentioned together. I think a marriage ought to be mentioned together. But you'll find also that Priscilla is also always, always, usually mentioned before Aquila, before her husband. And that's odd for Scripture. Women are not always mentioned, especially in front of the man. But here when it comes to their marriage, you find that it's, they they say Priscilla and Aquila. That tells me that Priscilla was no slouch. 
Come on, ladies. Priscilla was no snouch and, and Aquila was no um, chauvinist. You know, you just stay home and cook and clean. And you just make sure my laundry is folded. You don't want to say nothing. All the guys are quiet. Just make sure my laundry are folded and all the diapers are changed. No, no. He was an empower of his wife. He said, God has given her gift. God has given her talents. God, the same calling that's on me is the same calling that's on my wife. Come on, somebody. I haven't been called to walk, and my wife walks five or six steps behind me. We're called to walk side by side in this vision. We're called to walk side by side in this mission. See, the second thing a mission marriage has is values. Values. I had my wife help me with this sermon, and she made an acronym out of values. V stands for vision. We've talked about vision. We're talking about how important it is for marriage to have vision. The A stands for agreement. Somebody say agreement. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 9 through 12, I think every married couple should memorize this scripture, should write this scripture on a poster, put it on your wall at home. It says two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor, for if they fall, one will lift up his companion. And this is the one, and husbands, you're going to relate, but woe to him who's alone when he falls. I'll tell you, the couch is a cold place to sleep. A clean kitchen is a horrible place to hang out in. Woe to the man who can't get along with his old lady. Can I hear an Amen. You, you should read this. You should, you, you know, you should memorize this in your spirit. It says, for woe to him who's alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up, no one to help him. Come on now. He says, but again, if two lie down together, they keep warm. That's a good part. He said, how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. I think that third fold is the kids. Can I hear an amen? Come on, clap if you believe that we ought to walk in agreement. The L stands for love. Somebody say love. Look over at your spouse and just tell them I love you. No, your spouse, not your neighbor, your spouse. If they're across the room, just shout, I love you, honey. Text them, I love you. Values, vision, agreement, love. Somebody say love. And I was studying love. I, I said, God, I want a scripture about love. There's so many scriptures about love. But the one the Lord pointed me to is in Psalms 91. Because I think before we can love our spouse or love our brother and our sister, we've got to get a glimpse of God's love for us. God's love for us. The Lord shows us what his love is. And I'm going to give you some homework. You go home after this service and you read Psalms 91. Because the Lord says, because he loves me, I'm going to do all this stuff for them. Because he loves me, I'm going to do all these things for my servant who loves me. I think before we can love someone else, and we, we, before we can love our spouse correctly, we got to learn to understand God's love towards us. And we've got to have a good love towards the Lord. We've got to have the true love of God. There's different types of love. You got phileo love, which is a friendship love. You got eros love, with this, which is an erotic love. Some of y'all need deliverance from that kind of love. <laughs> but the friendship love and the eros love, those are temporary loves. Those are types of loves that don't always last. But there's an unlimited love. And the unlimited love you find is in Psalms 91. It's called the agape love. It's the unlimited love. It's the unconditional love of God. And it's the love of the Father for us. It's the love that took Jesus to the cross. That yet while we were sinners, he still died for us and forgave us of our sin. We didn't deserve it, but he loved us anyway. That's the love of the Father. That's the love that we need. See, the love of the Father towards us shows us how we ought to love in our relationships, how we ought to love in our marriages. The reason marriages break down, the reason relationships break down, the reason marriages become twisted and relationships become twisted is because our relationship with God is not whole. And one thing I've learned, hear me, hear me singles, hear me married people. When our relationship with God is whole, every other relationship will be whole. 
If you have broken relationships and your marriage is broken and your friendships are broken, take a look at your love for God. You, you can fake it. You can put on a show. You could be the first to shout in church. You could be the first at the altar. You could act real holy, but you're not praying and you don't really understand the love of the Father. You got to get that right before you can learn to love anybody else. Oh, come on and clap in this way. I'm trying to help somebody this morning. Psalms 91, because he loves me, I'm going to do all these things for him. And when you read that, that's what we ought to do for one another. See, love is vertical before it's horizontal. I think the problem with this generation is you want to find a horizontal love before you develop a vertical love. Come on, somebody. Well, I'll get real strong in the Lord if I find me a spouse. Or I'll get real strong in the ministry. If I, no, no, no. Get strong with the Lord first. This ain't TikTok. This ain't Instagram. You can't swipe for a spouse. You got to go to the Father and let the Lord lead you when you are whole and when you have a... Talk to me, somebody. Love. Love on a two-way street. Okay, I won't say. The U stands for understanding. Every marriage needs understanding. A better word for understanding is a word called empathy. I looked up the word empathy in the, in the, in, in the dictionary. It means the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. You know, when we understand the needs and the feelings of our spouse, it's easier to compromise and come into greater agreement. You know, we hear about compromise in marriage and compromise and finding middle ground. You'll never find middle ground until you learn to emphasize, em, em, empathize with the one you love. Sometimes you got to ask God to show you your spouse's pain, show you your spouse's struggle. We, we need more compassion in marriages. We sometimes put a high demand and, and we put high, high, how do you say, uh, a strict demand on our spouse. And you got to do this and you got to do that. And, and they're just dying like, are you kidding me, man? I'm, <laughs> I'm not Jesus. I'm trying to be like Jesus, but I'm not there yet. And sometimes we've got to empathize with our spouse and learn to understand what they go through as men. Learn to Understand what they go through as women, especially when you get older. Where are my older married people at? Where are my veterans? Let me, man, when you're young, come on. Love is easy. Marriage is a little easy in a sense. But when you get older, oh boy, your body starts changing. And things start getting loud. You like turn the TV down and that's too loud, and you can't see no more. Come on, look at that night. Let me put my glasses on first. I can't even celebrate with you because I can't see it. And when your body starts changing, that's when you got to learn to empathize with your spouse and say, listen, baby, I know you're going through something physically, but I'm going to go ahead and go through it with you. I love you. I'm by your side. And when I go through it, you go through it with me as well. And we're going to make it through this next phase of our marriage. Oh, come on and clap in this place. Some of us have spouses that have battled sickness. We've battled things in our body. But thank God for a husband or a wife that sticks it out with their loved one and says, I'm going to be with you not only in the good times. I'm going to be with you by the hospital bed. I'm going to pray you through this situation. Come on, clap for those spouses. Clap for those marriages. That's what makes the church great. That's what makes the church great. Great. Somebody say amen. amen. And the S stands for security. I'm almost done. Did you get something this morning? Yeah. Security. Somebody say security. security. Actually, E stands for embrace. Embrace values. Make that determination in your marriage. Make that determination right now that you're going to start embracing values in your marriage. That you're going to build your marriage, and you're going to govern your marriage by the word of God. You're going to govern your marriage by the word of God. And then the security values, when you have values, you embrace these values. The S is security. It brings security and safety. That's what marriage needs. It needs security. It needs 
a spouse to know that God is in the midst. Every man needs a, a level of security. The way you make a man feel secure is you make him feel honored and respected. Come on now. You make him feel honored and respected. I don't know what it is about us guys, but when we feel disrespected, it throws us off. We fought in the streets over respect. Understand, boys will be boys. So we fought in the neighborhood. Like, you disrespect me? What? Booyah! Come on, somebody. Who was there? <laughs> Who do you think you're talking to, homeboy? Come on now. And then you get married, and your wife starts calling you every name in the book. Come on, somebody. You're like, oh, I don't know what to do here. I didn't grow up like this. <laughs> you dirty scoundrel. <laughs> Whatever she calls you. You low down, dirty dog, whatever she calls you. And you're like, oh, I feel so disrespected. Ladies, we've got to respect our men. Yeah. We've got to respect our husbands, even the ones that say, you know, they're not spiritual giants yet, but you respect them till they become it. Right. Come, on. Come on, somebody. Come on. You start speaking to them like the man you desire them to be. Right. Oh, my God. Because I believe that when you speak to them by faith, you are prophesying to them. You are a man of God. You are a mighty man of valor. You may not be there yet. I'm not going to tell you that. But I'm going to speak to you like you're already that. Because I know that God loves you and he has a plan for you. And I'm praying for you. And men need that honor. They need that respect. How many can say amen? And if you've said bad words to your husband, you, today, today. <laughs> today you go you said babe I'm sorry I didn't mean to talk to you like that I felt convicted there that's okay it's okay to be convicted we can say amen that's why we come to church and we sit in that chair sometimes we tell us pastor tell us how to act at home tell us how to behave at home Tell us how to talk to our spouse. Tell us how to talk to our kids. Who feels like that's the kind of preaching this world needs today? Come on. It's okay to, to feel it sometimes. And then ladies, men need honor. But what ladies need is they need security. They need security. They need to feel secure in their marriage. You know, it's not the type of security that men offer. Sometimes, well, I bring home the bacon. Well, brother, that's a small piece of bacon, I'm saying. <laughs> Can't barely feed two kids on that bacon. <laughs> well, I work all day, and I work hard, and, you know. And I think we ought to celebrate men that work hard. There ain't nothing worse than a lazy man. So I thank God for hardworking men who provide security physically and financially, and then also physically. I'm... Don't mess with my lady. You know, don't mess with my kids. I'm a physical man. I'll take you down. I know MMA. I'll put you in a headlock, a leg lock. Knock you out. Okay, thank God for that. But ladies, <laughs> ladies, they don't want that physical security. They don't want that financial security. They want that spiritual security. Come on. They want to know that they got a husband that knows how to seek the face of God, that knows how to be in the atmosphere of the Holy Ghost. Come on, who knows how to comfort them? Come on, who knows how to speak the right words? Who knows how to pray for them? Lay hands on them. Come on, somebody. Who's going to be that one that's a hit with them? When tough times come, he's not going to run to the bar. He's going to run to the altar. He's going to run to the house of God. He's going to run to the word. Come on, ladies, help me preach. This is your turn. Who wants a man that will bring spiritual security to their marriage and to their children? I think as men, we got to be those men that when the going gets tough, the spiritual tough get going. So values. And as they come to the keyboard, I'm, I'm stirred up. I thank God for what he's doing in our church. I thank God that the women are encountering Jesus every week. On Monday nights, you're encountering Jesus. How many ladies are on fire for Jesus? Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, when is it, Tuesday? Amen. They're just encountering the Lord. But men, get ready. There's a men's ministry rising up in our church. David's mighty men. Come on, we're going to raise up some young men in the word of God. And we need some of you older men to fire up right now and say, hey, the church needs marriages. Clap for the Lord in this place. Come on, celebrate. I'm done. Come on, clap for the Lord.
One last thing. Missional marriages possess vision, possess values, but lastly, and I think most importantly, missional marriages possess valor. Everybody say valor. In Romans 16, 3, you, you've got to read it. Please read it. And read it again and again because when Paul says to Priscilla and Aquila, he's thanking them. He's thanking them. He's acknowledging them. And, and let me tell you why. Not just because they were good to each other, but they were a great asset to the good of the church. He's thanking them, not just because they're good. Look, we got a lot of people that are good to each other, but have you been good to the church? Have you been good to the kingdom of God? And he says, not only do I thank you, but all the churches of the Gentiles thank you because without you, without your marriage, we don't know if those churches would be here. Isn't that powerful? Think of the impact that we make. God used them greatly. How did God use them? Well, first, they received Paul when he came in the persecution under great stress, and he came to Corinth. They were also tent makers like Paul, and they received him. They welcomed them into, into their home, and for 18 months, Paul lived there. And I can only imagine what that was like. Imagine having an apostle live with you. Imagine the conversations. Imagine the prayer meetings. Imagine the revelation. No wonder Priscilla and Nicole were fired up. They just spent time together in their home and hearing Paul pray and write the Ephesians in his bedroom. Paul lived with them, and it was a powerful time. The second reason God used them is because they, they accompanied Paul across the sea to Ephesus, and they saw a great revival in that land. It was in Ephesus with Paul that they met a young Egyptian leader by the name of Apollos. Listen to this part. And Apollos, while he was a learned man, he spoke accurately with great fervor. His knowledge of the ways of God was incomplete. And one day he's teaching and he's talking about how he was baptized in water, the water baptism of John. And Priscilla and Aquila says, he doesn't know. He doesn't know that there's a real power. And so they pull him out and they say, Paul, can we speak to you? Have you been baptized in the Spirit? He says, no, I haven't even heard that there's a Spirit. And they laid hands on him and the Holy Spirit came on Apollos. Come on, somebody. That's a power couple. That's a power couple that saw something happen in a leader's life. And then lastly, Paul thanks them. He says, you know what? You put your own neck on the line for me. You put your neck on the line for me. One, one, one commentator said, for my life's sake, Priscilla and Aquila submitted their own throats to the knife. And when I begin to think about that, because when you, when you study it, you find that people say that they did that because there was assassins hired by the religious leaders to kill Paul. So they were stalking Paul, looking for an opportunity to kill him. And I think of a powerful couple that when they went to kill Paul, who was their pastor, their friend, and an apostle, they stepped in the way and said, mm -mm, deal with us first. What could the church do? What could the people of God do if we had some marriages that would stand for God and stand for the vision and stand for the, come on somebody, what could we do? And some of you understand this language because you used to do it for the neighborhood. That's a victory outreach marriage, man. You used to do it for the neighborhood. Some of you did it for your gang. But guess what? Now we're Christians. And God is raising up people that are going to stick their neck out for God and say, listen, if you mess with my brother my sister, you got to mess with me. Those are the types of marriages we need. Oh, come on and clap. Come on and clap louder. Those are the types of marriages we need. That's a VO marriage. They don't, they don't run. They fight. They don't flee. Come on, somebody. They know how to take their stand for God. Stake, take their stand for their pastors, their churches. Come on, somebody. Clap for the Lord if you believe that's where it ought to be. Come on, stand with me and clap. I, I believe the Lord has spoken this morning. 
Now, maybe you look at this sermon today and you say, man, Pastor, I, you know, I, I look at my marriage and I don't see it there. I don't see it at that place. Or maybe at one time it was at that place. But you kind of, you know, in a sense, things happen and we get dislodged a little bit. Well, here's what I want to say to you. If you don't like what you've built, just start over. Start over. Sometimes you could look at your marriage and say, man, I just don't like how this has gone. These last few years, I don't feel like a Priscilla and Aquila. I feel like Homer and Marge. I'm serious. I feel like Al and Peggy Bundy. Can I hear an amen? I don't feel like Priscilla and Aquila. But understand me, brothers and sisters, that the Lord wants to bring the cutting edge back to your marriage. He wants to bring a cutting edge back to your marriage. And you can get into a place sometimes and say, man, I just don't like what has become of this thing. Well, guess what? Here's the good news. Just start over. See, my wife has been married to seven men. They've all been named Al. You go through a change. You go through a transformation in your life. There's mistakes I made as a young husband that I don't make today. There's ways of thinking that I had as a young husband that I don't think that way no more. There's just certain things in my life and the way that I used to go about living life as a young man, even in ministry, that today I'm not that man anymore because God has a way of bringing a new season and giving us a new opportunity. And God says, I'm the God of the second chance. I'm the God of the seventh chance. I want you to do something today. I want to pray for marriages. Even if your spouse is not in this service, I want to pray for marriages. I, I want to pray for those of you that say, Pastor, I, that was a powerful message. I feel like I want to be, I want to be like that Priscilla and Aquila. I want to have that cutting edge, that commitment. Wherever you are in this place, if you're married, would you come on up to this altar? Come on up and stand up here and say, Lord, I'm going to start over. God gives us a second chance.